and good morning everybody. Hopefully this is working. First thing to do is to check that there is actually audio coming through. I haven't run OBS from tap tap on the keyboard yet. I uh, didn't mute the microphone when I was running that little intro thing. So we've got audio, we've got video, we've got chat. So now we can have a car crash. Okay. Well, good morning everybody or evening or whatever from around the world and um, what I'm going to do is unlike previous Eagle uh, project walkthroughs that I've done where I've just opened projects and then talked about them this is more about general Eagle techniques and in particular how managed libraries work and how they enable integration with Fusion 360 only 144p uh, okay <laughs> yes, <laughs> Sion knows that the, I've had big woes with my internet connection. Uh, one of the reasons that I stopped streaming was that I had people complaining that it was coming out at like 320 by 240 resolution. So um, I'm on a better connection now. Hopefully this will work out okay and then I can do more live streams. So um, since Eagle was bought by Autodesk, there has been a huge amount of development that's gone on. Um, it was kind of stagnating for a little while, and once it came under Autodesk's control, it's gone through very rapid development. There have been a lot of frequent releases, and it seemed that just about every time you open Eagle, it'll say there's an update available. Now, it slowed down recently, but for a long time, they were very rapidly adding new features. And, <laughs> uh, and so it could be a little bit overwhelming. And one of the issues is that as they release these new features, some of them are a little bit half-baked. Things like managed libraries and the Fusion integration came out in a form that has been a little bit difficult to use, but it does allow you to do some cool things. So what I'm going to do now is start with some very basics, just a quick recap of how Eagle handles libraries, what they are, and uh, that's important to know because the, uh, the basics of how, um, how it manages parts and libraries internally uh, then affects how it works with things like Fusion 360 and how managed libraries work. So the, the very basics is that a parts library is a way to store information about parts that you can use in designs. If you have a, um, a schematic that you want to put together and then you want to turn it into a PCB, you need information about things like resistors and capacitors and everything else, how they'll be represented in the schematic, and then how they're physically represented on the PCB. So the library stores all the information about the parts that are available. Eagle comes with a number of built-in libraries and you can create your own. And third parties provide libraries as well. For example, the SparkFun libraries are very popular. There's um, the OPL, Open Parts Library from Seed Studio. Uh, Adafruit libraries, I think, um, quite a few others, and pretty much all the major manufacturers, like parts manufacturers, produce their own libraries too. So, um, the way a library works in Eagle is it tightly couples the schematic representation and the physical representation of the part. Um, <laughs> Uh, Kenneth, I'm not sure if you're being serious with the question about what is Eagle or not. <laughs> so, Eagle is the PCB design circuit that I, uh, software that I use, and uh, that's what you're going to be seeing today. <laughs> so, when a um, a part is defined in Eagle, it contains both the schematic representation and the physical representation, which might seem obvious if Eagle is all that you've used but it's not actually the way it's done in a lot of CAD systems. If you use KiCad, for example, you can work on a schematic and add a part to the schematic, such as a resistor, and it will put down the symbol for the resistor, but there is no association with how that is physically represented. You can, it's then a separate operation to take your schematic and uh, link that through to the PCB layout part of the software and then associate footprints. And the footprint is what specifies this is the shape of the pads of how it fits onto the PCB. So, um, 
so uh, in uh, the KiCad workflow, for example, you can do all of your schematic work without any specific association of how it's going to be physically represented. You could put down a resistor, which could be anything from like an 0201 tiny surface mount resistor to a massive like 7 watt wire wound resistor. And as far as the schematic is concerned, it's exactly the same thing. What you then do is when you do the PCB layout, you take the resistor and say, I'm going to assign a footprint to this and the footprint is going to be the type of resistor that I want. Now that is a very loose coupling or a decoupling between the schematic part and the PCB part. And that's actually traditionally how um, electronics design has been done. Eagle is probably slightly unusual in that it tightly binds both of those things together and, uh, and it has live updates. So if you have your PCB and your schematic windows open, you make a change in the schematic, the part physically appears on the PCB simultaneously. So the two are very tightly coupled. Uh, so it's important to keep that in mind. Now the other thing about the way Eagle uses its parts libraries is that it considers them to be a place to copy information from, not a place to refer to. And so what I mean by that is you can download a um, someone else's Eagle project and you don't need the libraries for the parts that they've used on their project. You can download just their, um, their .board file and their .schematic file and open it up in Eagle and everything will be correct. The footprints will be on the board, the, uh, all the parts will be on the schematic, but you don't have the libraries. And that's because what happens when you take a part from a library and place it onto a schematic is that it copies all of the information out of the library and embeds it directly into the project that you're working on. And that means you can save the project and you can send it to someone else. They can open it and use it and modify it. They don't need your libraries. So that has some interesting implications. Uh, I actually quite like the, this approach, the way Eagle has done it, because it means that projects can be self-contained and easy to share, um, but they still get the benefit of, uh, of using libraries that you can update. And because when you actually add a part to an Eagle project, it remembers um, the reference to where it came from. So if you're looking at a part in a schematic and you look at the info on it, it'll say this part came from library, blah. And then if you change the part in the library, you can resynchronize it and update your part in your project. So what you end up with is essentially locally cached information within your project that references a library that contains the definitive information about all the parts that you've used. And then you can share those libraries around if you want other people to use them. So um, let's just have a quick look at some things. Oops, I just locked my screen unexpectedly by dragging down to the corner. There we go. Let's have a look at what I've got here. Just as an example of what we can do with um, with Eagle and Fusion 360 integration and where we're going to go today. And I'll take you through the steps of how we actually achieve this. But first, we've got to look at what we're doing and why we're doing it. This is the schematic for a little um, ESP32 and ESP8266 uh, programming dongle that I've just been working on. And uh, so we've got the schematic view here, which has parts like this um, USB Type-C connector and it's come from a library. You can see there's multiple versions of the library. And then if we switch over to the board view, we can see that this um, USB-C connector, which is right here, is that same part. And those two reference each other. So if we look at the information on this, we can see, once again, it comes from library superhouse connectors, version three. Now, because I have been uh, maintaining the parts for this project in a managed library and I've associated three models with them, what it means is that 
this design can be pushed through to Fusion 360. So I've already got the link in place for this. I'm going to show this from starting from scratch later. But if we come across the Fusion 360 link, we can see it's out of sync and you can push to Fusion. I'm not going to do that right now, but what I'm going to do is switch over to Fusion 360. And this is the exact same board. So you can see it's got the USB-C connector on it. And there's the USB to serial uh, adapter chip. You can see there's a nice model there for the, uh, the polyfuse up the top connector. So you can see the right angle connector and how it all fits together. So what we've got there is a, um, is a great representation of physically how this board is going to come out. And it looks really pretty and I'd probably do it you know, just for that purpose. You can go from the, uh, the relatively abstract view and this is what you'd normally be looking at inside Eagle while you're doing board layout. And you can switch to an actual representation of physically how it's going to look not just as a flat board, but in three dimensions. So um, that I have found, even just doing this, I found from my point of view is very helpful because it allows me to uh, pick faults that I might not necessarily otherwise notice unless I ordered the boards and got uh, prototypes coming in and then physically look at the board. Sometimes there will be clearance issues around large parts like switches and other things and uh, you can catch them very easily like this but a lot of the time it's just aesthetic and uh, I find that things like the position of labels and how well everything or how clearly everything fits together is much more obvious when you're looking at a 3D view like this than uh, when you're just looking at the abstract view in Eagle like this. So I've obviously got a bunch of layers and things turned off here, which uh, doesn't help in terms of it being an accurate representation. Uh, but the difference between seeing it like that and seeing it like that is enormous. Uh, but apart from that, it also has some very interesting uh, practical applications. I'm going to show you another project uh, which I've been working on for a little while with my friend Chris and I've just got to find that. So a project that I've mentioned a number of times before is the hand heater project and I've shown uh, versions of this in a previous live stream almost a year ago and um, we've gone to a major revision of this board this is version 2 of the hand heater, well, actually version 2.1 now because we've made some fixes. And this is the base PCB. Now you'll notice that there are some slots in here. It's a bit of a weird shape. There is this, There are these slots on the right hand side. That's because this project actually consists of three PCBs and two of them need to interlock, like they physically interlock. So if we look at that slot there, keep that slot in mind. And I'm going to open up another board, uh, the fan board, this one. Okay, and this board has these two tabs that stick down and those two tabs go through the slots so that those boards mount at right angles. One board horizontal, the other board goes down through it. And then you solder the, um, the contacts as they intersect at right angles. Now, I can describe that to you and wave my hands around, but it's a little bit hard to visualize. And that's where Fusion 360 can be really useful. So if we come back into here and I have a look at uh, Hand Heater 2, this is the, uh, the base PCB, and you can see that it's got the two slots in here. And if we turn it right over, you can see that there are uh, pads on the bottom. So these are uh, exposed copper where um, where it can be soldered on. And you can also see that the connectors on the back are exposed. There is a button um, which comes through, so that's the, the mode button. And this allows us to do things like design a case physically around this particular device. Now I'm going to jump ahead. We go to Hand Heater Assembly Project. This is a case that was designed uh, by Chris 
And the way we did this is I did all of the electronics design, Chris did all of the 3D design. And essentially we sat side by side. He was on his computer, I was on my computer, and I worked on the PCB, he worked on the case. And it's all referenced through a shared project in Fusion 360. So uh, if we spin it around, you can see that the connectors are there on the back and the button is exposed. And by doing it this way, we can physically check, well not physically, but we can check the representation of whether everything aligns with the holes in the case. And um, I'll just spin this down. What have we got? Stainless steel case. I'll make the top of the case invisible. And you can see there's the model of the fan in there. There's the base PCB and you can see the fan PCB mounted vertically and how it intersects. And this is much easier to understand when you see it in a three-dimensional representation like this than just the flat abstract view that you see in Eagle. And you can also see things like the standoffs, so we can check clearance on standoffs. And um, these are big 7 watt uh, wire wound resistors that hang off the front. And uh, just to check clearance, Chris made some little cylinders that represent those. Normally there would be leads, of course, coming up here into the PCB, but uh, we don't have those on the design. But by uh, pulling these components together into an assembly like this, it lets us uh, design the case around the requirements of the PCB and make sure that everything is going to fit. And in fact, one of the things that we found while we were doing this is that I didn't allow enough clearance. I had the wrong dimensions on this object here, which is the voltage regulator. It's a little switch mode um, regulator module. And I hadn't measured it correctly and when we got the, um, the first PCBs back, I discovered that it was sticking off the edge of the PCB here. And uh, so what we did was move everything to the right two millimeters. So if I spin it around here, we moved the voltage regulator, the connectors and the button all moved down to the right. And I did that in Eagle and synchronized it. And it then came through and was reflected in this model and Chris then modified his part of the model, which was the case. And we can see that the design of the sheet metal, which will actually be laser cut, um, it's laser cut stainless steel, and then folded in a, uh, a bend press, a break bend, whatever it's called. We could see that that will align properly with all of the parts on the PCB. Now, uh, this can be really super useful if you are doing something like 3D printing a case for a project or if you're 3D printing uh, like a, a jig or something to hold the PCB while it's being assembled. What you can do is pull the board into Fusion 360 and use the board as a component in your 3D design. And then, of course, you can just turn it off and be left with the 3D design itself. So you could then generate files for 3D printing or laser cutting or whatever it is that you need to do. So the result is that we have a, a really good representation of how it's going to fit together. And if I spin across here, um, I'm going to switch cameras again. And this is the actual physical device. Uh, which way you're looking at it. Probably that way is going to be aligned the same as the model that I was just showing you. You can see that there is one PCB that slots down through the other. It's soldered from underneath in these little bits where the, um, the pads meet at right angles. And the result was that starting from the 3D design, we had a very good idea of how this was going to turn out. And the next thing to do is to send the um, the files off, we need to make a, a flat uh, pattern for that laser cut folded uh, case. So we make a flat pattern, we send it off with a, a bend list, which shows where the bends are located, what angle they need to be bent to and all of that. And then that's done at the laser cutting place. So those are the sorts of things that uh, you can do with um, with the integration between Eagle and Fusion 360, which 
if I was doing this without this level of integration, would be um, would be a lot harder because what we would be doing is working from the dimensions of the board. If we looked at, if I just get rid of the case again, what I would have to do is uh, probably draw a diagram showing the position of where these holes need to be and give that information to now uh, to Chris or her, whoever is doing the mechanical design and they would then need to uh, apply all the holes and things within their design but you don't really have a way of correlating the two and making sure that everything works. So this level of integration is really really useful and uh, I've found it it's probably one of the best things to happen in Eagle for quite a while. Okay so now that I've been talking for way too long um, uh, I'm just going to take a quick look back through the questions. Nope, that's cool. All right, so that's the end result. And what we're looking at is how to um, how to achieve this. If you you might have an existing Eagle project or you are starting a new project, and in order to allow this to happen, what we need is to use some of the features in managed libraries. So let's back up and look at libraries. Um, okay, so back into Eagle. And I'm going to have a look at, oh, and also one other thing I should mention is that at the moment, what you are looking at here on the live stream is, um, is one screen and I'm switching between different views which is certainly practical and I spend a lot of time working on my laptop which is just a single screen but if you can manage it and you can set up multiple screens it's really beneficial when you're doing this type of work so let's see if I can switch over okay, so this is a um, this is what my desktop looks like I took this photo just this morning and you can see the uh, the bottom row of monitors uh, is my iMac, and then a couple of extra 27 inch displays. And what I typically have is the schematic on the left, the PCB in the middle, and the 3D version on the right in Vision 360. And as I'm working between the uh, the different parts of the project, everything is synchronized, and that allows me to have a view of the a view going from the most abstract to the most physical in terms of how it can be represented and being able to view um, in both those contexts is really super useful because I find that I end up doing a lot of backwards and forwards I will do something like make some changes within the board layout synchronize it to Fusion and then in Fusion I'll see how it's all fitting together and then that might make me want to make changes and then go through the process again. And um, being able to do that so that it's all visible at the same time is really, really handy. It's definitely not essential. And I probably spend about a quarter of my time working on my laptop. Three quarters is on this you know, crazy multi-monitor setup, but about a quarter of the time is on my laptop, which is just a single 15 inch monitor. And that's fine too, that works just fine. It just means you've got to keep switching between windows and modes. Um, so, let's see what we're going to work on. Um, what I was thinking of doing was taking a project and an old project that I've had sitting in Eagle for years and haven't modified for a long time and modifying it so that it uses managed libraries make sure we have 3D parts for each of those components and then link that through to Eagle, so that, oh sorry, to Fusion, so that we can visualize it. Um, okay, oh, just before I get into that, uh, some questions. So, uh, Unexpected Maker is reworking his tiny Picos. Awesome. And there was a question about Reflow Oven. Um, Chris Davies said, off topic question, what brand of reflow oven do you use? I've had some bad luck with a couple. Well, I'd be really interested to know, um, see on which type you use. I've got, 
Let me see. I can't even remember what brand it is. Uh, it's just over here. You might be able to see it. Oh, it's a T962C, which is basically as big as you can go in a desktop reflow oven. It's like that wide and that sort of size. Um, and it needs a 15 amp um, power connection. And I often run dozens of boards through it at a time. So I'm not sure what type uh, Signal uses. I'd be very interested to know, considering he's just put so many tiny pickos through. So, oops, wrong. I clicked the wrong thing in OBS. Right, so what I'm going to do is go into, let's have a look at the Ether 10. And this is a, um, a board that I did many years ago. I can't remember, um, in fact, what, when was the last revision on this board? Oh, 2013, that's not that long ago. Um, the original version, I think, was done in 2010. And this is essentially equivalent to an Arduino Uno. Down here it's got the AT Omega 328P, the same processor as on Uno. And it's got an AT Omega 16U2 for the USB to serial converter, same as on Uno. Um, it's got the power auto switching and everything else. The difference is that it also has this WizNet uh, IC in it, which is the Ethernet uh, controller. And it's got a micro SD card as well. So it's like an Arduino Uno, but with Ethernet built in and a little bit of prototyping area just for the fun of it. And the board looks like this. It's, um, where is the prototyping area? I oh, know there is none in this particular design. So um, let's come back to T Place. So that looks a bit more like what we would have physically. And we can see the um, the main microcontroller over here on the right, the 328P. In the middle, this one is the Ethernet controller. Over on the left, we've got an RJ45 socket. And this is the sort of project where it could be quite useful to have a 3D model because if you're going to enclose this in a box or um, you're going to build it into some other project in order to add uh, Ethernet connectivity to your project, it's useful to have a model for where the connectors are. So the objective today is to take this project and uh, link it into Fusion so that we can see a 3D version of it and um, learn about possibly how to go back the other way. We'll see how time goes. Now, at the moment, this project doesn't exist in Fusion 360. It hasn't been modified since 2013. It doesn't use managed libraries. It's just sitting here on my, um, my desktop. Um, okay, so a question from um, Ajim, I think it is pronounced. How much time does it take to render the 3D model after you commit a change in the schematic? Um, the answer is no time at all. It takes a, a little bit to synchronize the project to Fusion, but once it's in Fusion, you can manipulate it in real time and rotate it, do whatever you like. Uh, and you're about to see that. So. What we'll do is, well, and also the first thing I should mention before we do this is you obviously need Fusion. So you don't need Fusion to use managed libraries, but um, I'm going to, but in order to do this 3D stuff, obviously you do. So you need Eagle and you need Fusion, and they both need to be sign, signed into the same Autodesk account. So uh, that's how the, um, the cloud service manages the link between the two. Uh, I already have Fusion running, and if you come across to the right here, you'll see these little tabs that popped up in a reasonably recent version of Eagle. There's the manufacturing tab, which you can use for um, generating, like for accessing CAM to generate the um, Gerbers for production, and it shows you a, a preview 
it's a little bit more of a physical representation of what the board is going to look like. And uh, there is also this uh, Fusion 360 tab. Now, one of the things that um, you'll find as you go through this process is there are way too many dialog boxes and way too many confirmations and modal dialogs, which can be a bit annoying, but once you get into the swing of it, it's okay. Now, because this particular project has not ever been linked to Fusion, it, uh, it needs to generate an association between the Eagle project and a Fusion project. And it's giving me an option. It says I can either link it to an existing Fusion 360 design um, or I can create a new design. Now, in this particular case, I'm going to say create new Fusion 360 design. So we're just going to start with a totally clean slate and make a new project in Fusion. So I click that box and I'll go next and choose a location. Now, this is where it has um, gone out to the Autodesk Cloud Service and it's got a list of all of the projects that I have in Fusion and presents me with a list of them so that I can then put this into one of those locations. So I'm logged in as myself, as it shows, and it shows all these different projects. Now I'm going to put it inside Free Trunks and um, just hit OK. And this next dialog is very interesting. Um, because of the size of the screen and the live stream, you may not be able to read much on this, but um, what it's showing is a list of all of the parts that are on the design that it is about to push to Fusion. And it shows whether it has a 3D package. Now initially, of course, this doesn't have any 3D packages associated with anything. And it starts with, so the part is H3 and the footprint is 1 by 0 06. So that's one of the headers on the PCB and there is no 3D package. Uh, C26, obviously a capacitor, 0603 footprint, no 3D package. And we can scroll down, we can see that it's going to push every single one of these parts across into this Fusion project, uh, but with no uh, 3D packages. And it, um, it has a default way of dealing with that. And we'll see that in just a second. Um, I'm not going to bother typing a description of changes. You can put that in if you like. I'll just click on push. Now this part can take a little while. And um, it'll say initializing push to fusion. This is when it's collecting all of the information that is on your board. And it is sending it off to the Autodesk cloud service. So that Fusion 360 can see it and then pull it back down. And um, you end up having to go through this cycle quite a few times, which means uh, it could be a drinking game. Every time you do a push to fusion, take a drink. You'll end up totally sloshed by the end of this. But uh, eventually this will come up with a thing saying, yes, it's push to fusion. And you can hide this. Like if, if I click hide now, I won't do it this time through, the first time through, we'll just let it do its thing. It then allows you to get on with working in your project. You can modify things and it will be doing the sync in the background based on the design at the point where you, you hit that uh, dialog. So it says your Eagle board has been successfully pushed to Fusion 360. To edit your PCB in Fusion, ensure that the PCB feature box is checked in Fusion preferences under preview, which uh, probably means absolutely nothing to you right now. And it doesn't really need to mean anything much to you. We'll just hit OK, and then I've got to hit close to confirm this. So it might not seem like a lot, but we've just had to step through a series of dialog boxes in order to do that push. Now, if I switch back to Fusion 360 and I'll go back into the list of projects and you'll see that this is the same list that was in that synchronization dialog. Come down to Freetronics because that's where I said that I wanted to make that project and it's now pulling down the Ether 10 project. There was already the 11 in there. Ether 10 is a new one. And you'll notice that it says V1. And so if we open that project in Fusion, we will be able to see a representation of the PCB at least. 
but not the parts. And that's what we get. It's a, a little bit of a mess, but it's a start. So we've now got the, um, the PCB represented in 3D, and now that it's synchronized, we can just spin around it. We can treat this just like um, any other component in Fusion 360. So if you're familiar with Fusion 360, you, we can come up to the PCB component up here and activate it. And then it's got all of these different uh, subcomponents which represent the different parts. And ultimately, these are what will be the 3D models for each of those parts. But at the moment, it's just a placeholder. If you push parts out of Eagle into Fusion and there is no model associated with the part, what it does is basically just make a box. And so that's what we see here. If we look at this, uh, this design, you can see a whole lot of very, very skinny little boxes that just represent the physical outline of where that part is going to be. And it looks like a bit of a mess. So as I'm dragging it around, because they're, I think they're essentially zero height um, objects, as I'm dragging it around, they blink in and out of existence and it looks kind of crappy but we at least now have a physical representation of our PCB inside Fusion. So now we can start the job of replacing the parts with managed library parts. So I think I need to back up a little before we really start that and um, show you how to make a managed library. So if you have an existing library that you uh, that you've been using in your designs and you want to convert it into a managed library. Actually, before I get into that, I should back up even further. You need to make the decision as to whether you want to do this or not. Uh, because once you commit to using a managed library, it's difficult to go back. It is possible. You can, um, you can export from a managed library and make a local non-managed version, but uh, it, it can be difficult. Basically, it's stepping into the abyss. And most of the time that's okay, particularly if you are a single um, engineer, you're just working on designs on your own. But if you have a workflow where you have multiple people working on a system and you need to be able to share libraries between them, at the moment, the way managed libraries work makes that really hard. And it's a, um, a very painful thing that Autodesk has been working on for more than a year they've been saying um, we are going to be supporting shared managed libraries within the next few weeks and they've been saying that for a year so um, one of the reasonably common workflows with traditional libraries or non-managed libraries is to use Dropbox and um, oh Michael Stevens asked can you use parts from GrabCAD Yes, you can. Um, you're going to be seeing exactly that very soon. Uh, so if you have, in fact, this is what I was doing. I have uh, my Eagle directory all managed in Dropbox. And what I would do is if I was working on my laptop and I made changes to a library and hit save, it'd sync to Dropbox, then I come back to my iMac and it'd be synced and the library would be up to date. So I was using Dropbox as a way to share them. And a lot of people do that in a team environment as well. But with managed libraries, that doesn't work. So if you are in a team in particular, um, maybe don't go for managed libraries just yet and keep a close eye on Autodesk and when they, go, when they release the, the shared managed libraries feature, because we really need that to take this from being good to being awesome. So, Okay, with all of those caveats out of the way, if you have your own local uh, library in the traditional Eagle style and you want to convert it to being a managed library, it's incredibly easy. Um, but I'm going to show you um, first how to make a new library, assuming you don't have one at all. Now, imagine that you have downloaded a project or you, uh, you have a project you've worked on and you might have used parts from other libraries. Now, obviously you need to be careful of licensing. I'm just going to assume that everything here is open source and you're using libraries that you're allowed to use. 
so what you can do is take your existing design and begin to create a new library from, uh, from those parts. Now, I don't need to do this, but I'm going to create one and then um, probably delete it afterwards just to show you what the process is like. So if we come into the control panel and I'll go up to new library and this is going to create an empty library, absolutely nothing in it. There are no parts and uh, right now it's not useful for anything, but it's open. Um, it's currently says untitled.lbr. When you create a new library, by default, it's just a local library, old style. And that's the way you begin. Then you convert it into a managed library. So I'm, what I'm going to do is, I'll see, normally I do this on multiple monitors. I'm going to see if I can make it all fit on one monitor so you can see what's going on. From the schematic, so I'm going to bring the schematic in so that it covers half the screen. And, oops. I've got the library visible here on the right half of the screen with no parts in it. So this would be starting from scratch. You wanted to create your own library to hold your parts and manage them and um, keep it all in one place that's under your control. And so we might have an existing design with parts in it. Now say I wanted to take this um, WizNet IC. Let's start with a complicated one. It doesn't really make any difference. And we want to take this out of the existing design, which we may not even have the library for, and store it into our own library so we can manage it ourselves. What you do is find the origin for the part, which is, in this case, is right here, and right click, uh, just as you would to do normal operations on that part. And right down near the bottom, you'll see copy device to library. You can also copy symbol to library, because we're in the schematic view, we can copy just the symbol, but I want to copy the entire device. I'll just do copy device to library, and you'll notice over here on the right, the library window has updated. Now I'll bring this back to full screen so that we can see more, and I'll go back out to the table of contents on the library, and we can now see that we have one part in our brand new unsaved local library, and it's the WS uh, sorry, the W5100, and we can see the device, the footprint, which is the physical representation of how this is going to fit onto the PCB. There is no 3D package, as you can see, and there is a symbol, which in this case is SQFP80. So it's an 80 pin part. So we can look at the device, which in, which in Eagle terms encapsulates both the uh, the schematic representation and the physical representation. So the device is like the combination of those things together. The footprint is the physical representation on the PCB. The symbol is the logical representation in the schematic. And those things are all bound together. So we now have all of the attributes of that part copied into our brand new library with nothing else there. And we can save it. So I'm going to, I'm just going to hit save and it will ask where I want to save it. And I'm just going to save it in the default location. That really doesn't matter because we're about to convert it to a managed library and it's going to move anyway. But let's call this um, Superhouse Test. And um, I'll show you some of the other libraries that I've got in a moment. But this is just to keep it out of the way. I'll hit save. So we now have our new library that is only local and it's called Superhouse Test. And one thing to remember though is that we haven't actually changed this original design. So this is the design that we've just taken the part from and we've extracted the part from the design including both its schematic and its physical representation and we've pulled it out into a library and stored it in that library. So we could use that part from that library in other projects. However, this local part is not yet referencing the new library. It's still ref referencing the original source, wherever it came from. We'll fix that in a little bit.
Um, we'll come back to that, but that's just something that you need to remember. By taking the part out of this design, sticking it in the library, we haven't changed the original design at all. We've just extracted something from it. So, um, now let's go and have a look at what's happening with our brand new library. Go back into control panel, spin up to the top into the libraries dialog and drop that down. And we can see here that there is a superhouse-test.lbr. That is the new library that we just created a moment ago. And so we can select it. But before we do anything else with it, uh, I'm going to convert it to a managed library. In the traditional workflow, you wouldn't do this. This is where you would stop. You would keep this library on your local computer and um, you would just add parts to it, edit parts, and use it in your designs. But this is where things deviate from the old workflow into the new way of doing things. So what I'm going to do is right click on that and it says create manage library. So I'll select that. And there are a bunch of dialogues that you go through here. It just gives you a little blurb about um, what it's going to do. And it says it's got a checkbox for archive local copy on create. Archive libraries are moved to. And it's got the path. In my case, it's users John documents eagle archive libraries. Uh, I'm just going to leave that turned on. doesn't matter because I'm not going to care about it after this anyway. And click Create. And what this is doing now, it says Creating Server Side Asset. It is taking the library that I have on my local computer and pushing it to the Autodesk Cloud service so that it's stored on their system and it can be synchronized through it. Uh, now, the way to think about this is that if you've done software development and you've used GitHub and you've had a local copy of your source code and there is a remote repository which is uh, on GitHub, it's kind of similar. You can have the local copy of all of your information, you can make changes to it, and then when you're ready, you push it up to GitHub and um, that way you keep the two synchronized. Similar sort of concept. The Autodesk Cloud service is a bit equivalent to GitHub. The big limitation, as I said earlier, is that you can't do sharing. So with the GitHub model, or with the Git model, I should say, you have you can have multiple developers working independently and synchronizing um, either peer-to-peer -peer or through a central repository like a GitHub repo. Now, a few years ago, Auto, uh, Eagle moved from a binary uh, format in its um, in its library to an XML based format. And so the, uh, just hang on a second. Nope, that's all right. Um, so what that means is that you can actually open um, libraries locally and it's just a chunk of XML. Now, one of the advantages of that is that it means that things like uh, text-based merge tools can be used and ultimately I think this is really going to be beneficial because uh, it can operate a lot more like the Git sort of model where you have changes occurring locally in multiple locations and then merging them. With the old binary format that was pretty much impossible. So uh, okay that was a bit of a diversion. So it says your library is now a managed library to assign 3D models to your components, double click, and etc. etc. I'm not going to care about that right now. We'll just click OK. And the library has now been moved. Now, if I look in this dialog, this is where it was just a second ago. A moment ago, we had libraries, we had this DTM library that's hanging around from something, and we had the Superhouse test library but it's gone. That's because it's been moved into the Manage Library section. And down here, it's got My Manage Libraries. You can see there's a bunch of Superhouse Libraries and then Superhouse Test. This is the new one with the W5100 that we just created. And uh, this little layout here, you can see that instead of just having a single library with all of the parts in it that I use, 
I've split it up into multiple libraries. And I did this because I saw that SparkFun had done it and uh, I really liked the idea. Once you end up with hundreds of parts, it can become quite cumbersome. And I really wanted a way of um, compartmentalizing, keeping uh, similar parts together. So I took inspiration from SparkFun and um, I named my libraries in a similar way to theirs. Uh, I've, got, I've done things slightly differently, but similar concept. And so now what we can do is have a look in Superhouse Test. And if we double click this to open it, we're back in looking at this library, same as before, but now you'll see that it's got a 3D package in here for this part. And by default, it's just a box. Uh, so it doesn't have any other way of knowing what that part is meant to look like yet. So it just creates a, um, a generic box. So, um, oh, <laughs> John just said, I've got to say, this is the first stream I've seen since I upgraded my internet. Being able to read the text on the screen is great. Yeah, <laughs> that is nice. Um, I was actually thinking of maybe reducing the resolution on the monitor I'm using for streaming so that everything is bigger. Uh, and I tried it just before the stream, but the aspect ratio was wrong. So I've left it at this current resolution. So what we can do now that we have this part in a managed library is change the reference. If we go back into the schematic and here we have um, IC6 and we want to change that so that it's no longer referencing wherever it came from originally. It's now referencing our new managed library. What we can do is click on the replace tool and select what part we want to replace it with. So I've got Superhouse Test just here, the W5100, hit OK, and I will click on this part and it will look like nothing has happened. That's because it's just replaced it in place with the same part. It's just referenced from a different library now. And if we go back to the board, the, um, the part is still there. It's this W5100 right in the middle and everything looks the same because we copied the part out of the existing design, we're guaranteed that everything is going to work because the reference point is the same in terms of where the, uh, the, the footprint um, is referenced and the pads are the same. It's exactly the same as what was in the design. It's just now stored in a different managed library. Uh, so what we can do now that we've changed that over well, what I'll do is I'll save this and I will push it to Fusion 360 just to show you what happens. And you can see here it says out of sync. Um, it's got an option for pull from Fusion into Eagle and also push to Fusion. Now, the reason for pull from Fusion is that you can make changes to the PCB in Fusion and pull it back into Eagle, which is really cool if you're doing a design that is an unusual shape. For example, if you have to do a board which mechanically has to fit into something weird and the drawing tools in Eagle just won't let you, you know, do that sort of geometry, you can design your PCB layout, well, your PCB outline, for example, in Fusion and pull it back into Eagle and you can move those changes bidirectionally. But for now, what we're going to do is push to Fusion. It still says there are no 3D packages for anything. I'll push and initializing, and this is when we all take a drink. Only water, not vodka. And eventually, it will have finished. So, any questions while we're waiting for this? Uh, it is, uh, um, Okay, I won't change the screen res. Um, <laughs> okay, so it's pushed. Now, this will help demonstrate part of the workflow as well. So we've now pushed this design um, to the cloud service from Eagle. We haven't actually changed anything substantively, but it's still considered to be a new version. 
Now, if I go back into Eagle, oh, sorry, Fusion, I've got the design open here. You can see the PCB. Over on the left, you can see that it says data in this folder has been updated. Refresh. So I will. Uh, what I'm going to do though is close and I will not save. I'll click on refresh over here and that will now pull down into Fusion the latest model of the Ether 10. So if I now open that, amazingly it's going to look very much the same as before, but that is about to start changing rapidly. So now we can see that uh, the board still looks flat. Um, you can see that the model is now slightly different. You can see that the uh, the other parts that didn't have any models at all previously are just two-dimensional. They're just a, um, a rectangle on the PCB. And there is actually thickness to the, um, the part that we've just updated. It's generated a 3D model, which is not still not really a 3D model, but it just has a bit of depth to it but we want to replace that with a, um, a proper 3D part. So this is where the interesting stuff begins. And we'll go back into Manage Libraries. Now, um, what we're going to do is edit the 3D package that is associated with this part. And there, this is where there are many traps. Um, it's where if you don't have the workflow just right, it can really screw you up. And this is the part where I got really, really frustrated when I was trying to do it because, oh, the first time, because often there would be no 3D package um, at all and I didn't know why. I'll show you that in a second. So there was nothing to edit. And then if you go to, it looks like you should just be able to go import 3D package, add import local 3D package, add from web, create with package generator or whatever and then make one, but that doesn't necessarily work. For example, if you say import local 3D package, you might think, oh, that's so I can upload a step file from GrabCAD or something. No, that is so that you can pull in a 3D package from an existing library. So you have to have the model in the first place in a different library, and it's all very frustrating. So you can go around and around in circles, banging your head, wondering why you can't find the dialog. Uh, we will get back to that in a second and I'll show you how to work around it. But luckily we're now in a condition in a state where we have this 3D package and if we just double click on it, it will open the package editor. And once again we have a little bit of a delay. Um, unfortunately the current workflow for this has little delays built in in many places, like when you're syncing, there's a delay, when you're opening the editor, there's a delay, generating 3D model, there's a delay. So you need a little bit of patience, but you can get through it. Uh, so what we've got now is the default 3D model that it created uh, just based on the physical outline that it found in the footprint. It's just put a box over it. And you have a couple of different options here. If you do add model, um, this references your local models, but and I've already got a bunch of local models, so I'm not going to do that. Um, if we go to upload step, we can select a step file. Uh, I'm not going to do that now. We are going to do that because that's very, very useful, but not for this particular um, thing. How do I make this dialog go away? I don't know. Let's try cancel. No, that closes the whole thing. So now we've got to open the editor again. Um, that add model dialog that I just showed you, this one here, which I will not click again, is very useful if you've already got a 3D model that you've defined for another part that is physically the same, but is in a different library or is a different type of part. And that can be fairly common with things like, um, uh, like say a, a SOT type component. You might have a SOT223, which could be a transistor and you also have a SOT223 um, diode or something, and they're totally different parts, but you can reference the same 3D model from it. So we're going to ignore upload step for now, we'll come back to that, and we'll go to generate model. Now, this is a really handy tool, and what I generally do is, if I can create a model using the generate model method, I do it, 
This is <coughs> a convenient system that's built into Eagle that allows you to generate models for standard electronic parts just by putting in some parameters and it resizes everything for you. On the left you can see it's got um, generators for um, quite a few different types of parts and um, so what we do is you just find the part family that you are wanting to do. In this case, what are we looking at? SQFP80, so it's an 80 pin QFP. And that is, where is QFP? Um, quad flat pack, there it is, QFP. So we just click on QFP and it shows a little diagram with all the different dimensions. And then down here, the values where we can type in what they, um, what they need to be. And it supports asymmetrical chips. So what we can do is say pins on the D side. In this particular case, it's an 80 pin, which means it's 20 per side symmetrical. So I'll just put in 20 and 20. And E, which is the pitch between the pins, is defaulted to 0.5. Now, I don't actually know what the pitch is for this part off the top of my head. I'd need to look up the data sheet to get the, uh, the exact dimensions. But my general approach to this is to generally trust what the model generator is going to do and then just um, change things if necessary. And I'm sure this is going to be wildly wrong as we're about to see, um, but I've set it to 20 pins on the sides and I've left all of the other dimensions the same, which means it's going to make a chip that's totally the wrong size. But let's just do it for the hell of it. Oh, and there's an option down here for thermal pad, but we don't really care about that. And so I'll click on the update preview. And what this does is take the parameters that we've just entered and it uses its part generator um, to make a representation based on those numbers that we've entered. And in a moment, it will update the display and we'll see what it's done. Okay, so we now have a three-dimensional representation of a part. Now, it's close, but as you can see, it's still wrong. The, um, the pitch on those parts must be wrong because if we look at the, uh, the solder pads that you can see underneath, and those solder pads came from the representation on the PCB. That's the actual footprint that we need to fit this part onto on the PCB. And we can see that the pins come out further. So the whole part needs to be reduced down in size. And in general, when uh, you're generating a model this way, it will end up pretty well centered, but not always. So there are these little manipulation handles here that allow you to do things like rotate the part. So if I, um, if I just grab the, um, the part, I can slide it around. And um, like if I want to move it just in one axis, I can click that and it will move on that axis and it won't move in any other axis no matter what I do. It's like it's on rails and it will only move in that direction. So you can slide it in that direction. Um, you can rotate it. So if I wanted to rotate it around um, that the Z axis, I could grab the circle and rotate it and it will kind of snap into place. So if I move it very close to being aligned here, there it goes, it just snaps into place. So um, often what you'll find is that when it generates the model, it won't be aligned to your footprint. So it might be at you know, a 90 degree angle or something crazy like that, or it'll be offset so that the corner of the model is in the center of your footprint. That's very common. So once you've generated the model, you just use these handles and you manipulate it, snap it into place. Uh, come on, move and snap. And before we really go any further though, we need to get the actual dimensions of a, um, a W5100 so that we can fix these dimensions. So let's go to, this could be dangerous. What's in my browser right now? Ah, okay. It's just the, um, the live stream window. So I'll bring this back across and I'll say, uh, Username W5100 data sheet. And oh look, Spark Fun published it. That's handy. 
and in here what we should have is the, um, the physical dimensions for this particular part. Usually the physical dimensions are right down near the bottom of the data sheet. So let's see what we can find. Maybe not, maybe in this data sheet they're not near the bottom. Nope, I might have to actually use the index. Oh, what did I see there? Nope. Okay, let's look at the index. Um, pin assignment, functional, application, electrical, package descriptions, that's what we want. Page 69, that's right at the end. Okay, maybe I just haven't even gone far enough. Page 69, here we go. So from here, we can look up the, uh, the dimensions for this part and then plug these numbers into the package generator and it will fix its dimensions. Now you'll see that the way these are commonly represented is that there will be letters that represent the different um, dimensions of the part. The, uh, and then there'll be a table that lists what those are. So it's kind of annoying, but you can see over here, for example, that the body from one side to the other is dimension D1. So we'd come down to here into the table and look at D1 and see that it's 10 millimeters. Um, there's the old imperial units there as well, but we don't care about that. And we can see what I'm really interested in right now is this dimension right here, which is E. Now what would be nice would be if these dimension tables all use the same letters to designate certain dimensions. And there are conventions, you'll find that a lot of the time these letters are similar, but they're not necessarily exactly the same. For example, we want to know the spacing here between the pins, which is E, the E dimension in this case. Now E is pretty much the standard convention for the dimension between pins. So you'll see that that's very common, but other dimensions are not necessarily so common. And you can see down here, the value for E is 0 0.4 and that is um, uh, from BSC, which basically means um, between centers. So that's not the gap between the pins, that's the center to center spacing of the pins. 0 0.4 millimeters. And now if we come back into Eagle, where we're looking at our generator, and we can see that the E value here is 0 0.5 millimeters. And that's why our whole part is too big. So I change that to four millimeters, 0.4 millimeters, update preview, and then we'll see what happens to the, um, the model. This may still be screwed up because the, um, the body does not necessarily change proportionally. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Oh, it has, it's done a good job. That's good. So we've now got a model that is pretty close. We can see that it's, um, it's slightly overlapping the uh, the actual pads. We can do some tweaking on that. Now, this whole process is probably sounding like it's take, going to take ages. And um, part of that is that I'm explaining things as I go. Part of it is that the very first part I picked is a very complicated part. And uh, a lot of the time, it's much quicker than this. So uh, don't be overwhelmed by you know, what I'm showing you here in terms of how complicated this is. It's not usually this, uh, this complicated. But what I want to do to make it a more accurate representation is just fix a couple more of the dimensions. And you can also see that my positioning is not quite right here uh, because there are an even number of pins on both sides. There are on each side, there's 20 pins on each side. And this center mark, it comes through a pin partly, which means it's not evenly set on that axis. And you can see also that the copper underneath is not quite aligned. Now, if I grab that little slider, move it sideways so that the, um, the center marker here comes between those two pins, it's 10 pins on each side, and the pins now align nicely with the copper. And in fact, if we look at the package inspector up on the right, we've got X, Y, and Z offsets all at zero millimeters now, and rotations all, all at zero. Um, now the reason it was actually off is because I was dragging it around earlier to show you. Um, by default, it would have ended up perfectly, uh, perfectly aligned. So, 
Um, all right, so now I want to fix these legs just a little bit. Um, one of the most important things in terms of 3D models is boundaries. I don't want this model to represent um, a fake idea of how big this part is, because when we look at it on the board, it might look like it's pushing into other parts, and there needs to be a reasonably accurate representation of the extents of the part. So what I want to do for that is I'm going to look at um, the data sheet again and let's see if there are a couple of other dimensions here that we could add in. One is this dimension here, L, which is the length of the pad where it's sitting, or length of the leg where it's sitting on the pad on the PCB. And L is given as three values. Now you'll often see two values and sometimes three values for things and these are to do with manufacturing tolerances. Uh, so the dimension that we looked at a little a moment ago which was the spacing between the pads E, it's given 0.4 millimeters as the spacing. That's a single number and if we look back into here E has a single number. You'll notice that these other part, these other variables like D has one value of 12.7 and another value of 13.1 and E 12.7, 13.1. And uh, that might seem a bit strange because that is a single dimension. Why has it got two numbers? The way this is traditionally presented is minimum and maximum to allow for manufacturing tolerances. <coughs> and these numbers can be a long way apart. Uh, now let's, so instead of that size, let's look at the overall package dimension. So D1 is the width of the package and E1, which is the height of the package, will be the same because this is a symmetrical package. So D and E, they're both 12, so 12 millimeters. Um, so that's a 12 by 12 millimeter part. Let's just put that in before we go any further because that could be throwing things off. So D will make it 12 instead of 12.7 and we'll make it maximum of 12 as well. So we've got 12 by 12. And so both the minimum and the maximum values are the same. We'll click update preview, let it regenerate. And while that is doing that in the background, let's go back to this L value which they've presented as having three values, 0 0.45, 0 0.6, and 0 0.75. Uh, and you'll very commonly see two values in the data sheet, uh, minimum and maximum. Now, the way this works is that they provide a minimum value and a maximum value, which are the absolute limits that this part could be manufactured to. And then the average value in this case, which is 0 0.6. So that dimension of the, um, the length of the foot that is sitting on the PCB pad could be anywhere from 0.45 of a millimeter to 0.75 of a millimeter. The average is 0.6 of a millimeter. And um, one, there are different reasons that that can vary. That could be um, things like how much contact there is could depend on your solder paste. It could depend on whether the part is pushed down hard onto the board and that causes deflection in the pins. So there, these tolerances you have to allow for. So we have a pad length of from 0.45 to 0.75. Now if we go back into our model, oh look, it's um, all of a sudden looking much nicer. Just changing the package dimensions has moved the pads in and that's actually pretty much what I would expect it to look like. So that's probably good enough. But just to demonstrate this point about the L value, oh is it L? No. It was L in the other one, but here, oh yes, it's L in here as well, capital L. And we have a value between 0.45 and 0.75. So we'll change the minimum to 0.45 and the maximum to 0.75. Once again, update the preview. Uh, because we've got a model now that looks pretty much like what we expect and it fits on the footprint, we really don't need to be messing around with this. But um, this is just to demonstrate how this particular feature works. All right, so it's updated the model. And if we zoom in on this, that little contact pad there is, 
Oops. I'll zoom too far. It's very touchy. This little contact pad here is the L value that we just edited. And uh, that should now be a, an accurate representation of the average of the contact point for that particular pad. All right, so we're finally just about there. We've now added a model for this part using the built-in model generator. And if we, up here, if we click finish, what this will do, oh, and before we do, one thing to check is the orientation designator. So just down here, you can see on the silk screen for this particular footprint, there is a designator for pin one. And in the 3D model, there is also a designator for pin one. Now it's possible that when the model is generated, it's rotated. Like it, um, it might could well have generated it in that orientation, in which case the orientation marker is not going to align. So you just need to rotate it and make sure that the orientation marker is correct. So we can now click finish. And what this will do is take the definitions of this model that we've created and associate it back with the library. And um, one option it has here is there's a checkbox for update package name, summary description, and metadata based on IPC parameters. And I always just leave that on. Um, what that actually means is that when we started editing this 3D part, in fact, if I drag this sideways, you can see in the library back here, the 3D package was called SFQP80, SQFP80 rather. And that was the default package name that was generated automatically based on the footprint. It just matches the footprint. But um, IPC standards are the standards that uh, are used for things like footprints of parts. And they define a way of naming parts that includes dimensions within the name, which means if you just look at the name of a part, which is a string of letters and numbers, from that you can derive a whole lot of geometry. It's like encapsulating the geometry of the part within the name of the part. Very meta. Uh, so I normally just leave that turned on and hit OK. And what this will do now is create the model and uh, save it into our library. And it will update the, the name of that 3D model with that those IPC parameters. Um, uh, okay, so this takes a little bit. It says uploading, so it's now um, pushing that model. And uh, while that's doing it, um, data sheets for the win. Yes, data sheets are awesome. Uh, they can be they can be scary if you haven't really done anything much with data sheets, but um, once you start looking into them, uh, the, the, if you're fairly new to electronics and you start looking at data sheets, the data sheets themselves just look totally overwhelming. There's so much in them; they can be hundreds of pages long, but there is so much useful information. And if you start by just looking for some of the basics, like if you look at the start of the data sheet, there'll be a summary page with things like acceptable voltage ranges and uh, other information about the part. Uh, that in itself can be really beneficial. And then usually right down towards the end of the data sheet, there will be the physical layout as we just saw. So if you get into the habit of starting to look up data sheets for the parts you use, you'll learn a huge amount and over time, you'll start to understand more and more about the data sheet and what it's trying to tell you. So, um, oh yeah, Martin said, weird how data sheet doesn't show the real 20 pins per side, just 11. Yes, so in the, um, the data sheet, if we go back to here, <laughs> you read that, you counted that? That's funny. So it's 11 and 11. So this is a data sheet specifically for an 80 pin part and in the footprint it only shows 11 pins per side so it's showing a 44 pin part and um, so if you just look at this diagram you would think oh that's what the footprint should be but no this is just an abstract way of representing where the dimensions are that you then need to extrapolate out for the full footprint now um, that's for parts with a very large number of pins, that's fairly common. 
for most smaller parts, it'll be an actual representation with the correct number of pins and everything. But uh, if they wanted to make this diagram fit with 20 pins per side instead of 11, uh, in order to make it fit on the page, it would have had to be smaller and then more difficult to read. So they've just used this as a representation of the spacing between the, uh, the critical features. It's kind of funny. Yes, Martin, I hadn't noticed that, but that is strange. So now if we go back into here, it's finished creating its, um, its 3D part. And you'll see that the package name has now changed. It's now QFP 40P 12 blah, 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 with a whole lot of information. So that actually encodes information about the dimensions of the part. Um, and we can see, for example, the 1200 X 1200 X 120 means that it's 12 millimeters by 12 millimeters by 1.2 millimeters. So there are, um, there's information within the name of the part. And if we, um, we click on that part, we can see a 3D representation of it right here. Now, this is another place where I got myself totally tripped up when I was first trying to do this. And it's, um, it can be very confusing until I had the mental model of how the local library works in relation to the cloud service. <clears throat> so everything I've been talking about so far, I've been a little bit vague about it. What happens with moving from a local model, uh, sorry, a local library to a managed library is that a copy of the library is taken and pushed to the cloud service. However, it's not all maintained online. There is a local copy as well. What that means is that, it, coming back to the GitHub um, analogy, it's like having your local source code repo on your computer. You can edit that, do whatever you like to it, and that will happen independently of what's happening up on your GitHub. So the cloud service maintains a copy, and you have a copy on your local computer, which means you can work offline, you can do everything that you need to do, uh, but you need to keep the two in sync somehow. Now, it's a bit hard to see, but way down in the bottom right, oh, you can't even see it because my face is over the top. Let's um, drag that up. So down here in the bottom right corner of the library, you can see a couple of icons. There is an exclamation mark, which means that it's been modified and it hasn't been saved yet. And there is this little icon, which shows that it's a managed library. Now, if I just hit S, or Command S for save, it's now saved. The exclamation mark has gone, gone away. And you'll see that instead of saying it's a managed library, it's saying managed draft locally modified. Now, this is what tripped me up and I couldn't get my head around this for the longest time. What this means is that we now have a copy of the library on our local machine, which has diverged from what's on the cloud service. And that means that if you use this library from a different computer or whatever, then your local changes will not be reflected in it. And the way to, uh, to update that is really is obscure. This name doesn't, this menu item doesn't make a lot of sense to me, <clears throat> but this is the way it is. The magic to fix this is you go up to library and create new version. And when I was trying to figure this out, I was looking at these menu options and thinking, create a new version, it just didn't seem relevant. It's like, what does, is that creating um, another local copy of the library? It didn't make sense. But what this actually does is create a new version on, it's like doing a commit and then pushing your commit. So we'll click create new version and it says a new version of your library will be created Note, any 3D packages uploaded through the web will be retained. Now, I haven't even talked about the web side of it, and I'm not going to today because that'll just confuse things. But all we'll do is click Create, and it says Uploading Library and Creating Server-Side Asset, Downloading Managed Library. So what this has effectively done is take the changes that we had locally, push them to the um, Autodesk Cloud Service, so it's updated the centrally managed version of the library, and then pulled back down again. So it's like doing a, um, a commit and then pushing it and then doing a pull back down and then having all the changes merged locally. 
and then if we go back down and look at the corner here, we can see it just says managed again. <clears throat> this is the state that we want the library to be in most of the time. It should be in a managed state. Um, and that means that you have a local copy, there is a copy on the cloud, and the two are in sync. They're both the same. You don't have any local changes. Everything is good. Everyone is happy. So we now have a version of this library on the local computer with this package. And we have the 3D package. And now what I can do is come back to the schematic of our project. And this particular part is now, let me see, I can't remember, I'll look at the info on it. Okay, so it's referencing Superhouse Test. It is now referencing our new library. We've made changes in that library by adding the 3D model, and we want that to be reflected in the project. So what we can do is come up to Library, Update, or Update All, and what this will do is attempt to apply updates that happen in the libraries to our project. So if I just click on Update, and actually no, I where are, where are we? Library, I'll try, I'll just do Update All. And it's complaining about some things, I'm gonna cancel on that. It's giving me some warnings, I'll just hit OK, I don't care. And it says, Library Update has modified the board. Please run a design rule check. Okay, I will just hit OK on that. And now if we go back to the board, and once again, you can't see it because my face is over it, but down in the bottom right corner, it's saying that the board is not saved. It's been locally modified. And so what I'm going to do is save that, come back into Fusion 360 Sync, and it says it's out of sync. I want to push to Fusion, oh, except that it's not letting me. Why is that? What have I done wrong? Hmm. Well, this is, oh, error, not authenticated. Ah, this is very annoying. Um, <laughs> it's actually kind of good that this has happened while I'm doing the live stream because it means I get to show you something that goes wrong and that I'd forgotten about. So, <clears throat> I don't know why this happens. <coughs> Excuse me. But periodically, um, it seems to forget that I'm logged into, uh, into the correct thing. So I click on edit source, try logging in again. I can't do it. Basically what this is saying is that Eagle can't connect to Autodesk in order to be logged into my cloud account. And uh, it can be a real pain. And you go into the control panel and here it says, yes, you're logged in. And it even gives you the option of go offline or sign out. So when this happens, um, so far I found that if you just go offline and go back online again, it's not enough. So what I'm gonna do is sign out. It's gonna go back to a free license and then it says unregistered, sign in, and I want to sign in as myself. And I don't know why this happens. Maybe it's um, a, mm, maybe it's an interruption on the internet connection or something, I don't know, but I'm just going to grab my Autodesk password here somewhere that you can't see it. Hopefully you can't see it, no. And paste it in. Because I maintain all my passwords as long random character strings. And now of course I have to authenticate with um, 2FA, so my Autodesk security code. Oh, you're going to see that. I don't think that matters because I'll be logged in by then anyway. 467. Enter. 
Now, in general use, I don't find that um, the eagle loses this um, this cloud connection very often. But when I'm messing around with managed libraries, it seems to do it fairly frequently. So let's just see now if it's happy. Um, now it's yep, that's better. So now it, it can get the um, the source from the cloud uh, service, and it can say it's out of sync. So we'll push to fusion. Now this dialog that we were looking at previously. This is the list of all of the parts that it's going to push as part of the design. They say no 3D package, but if we scroll down, oh look, oh L1 and L2, they have parts, there are a couple of other parts here. Um, now this, some of these parts have gained models because of that uh, library update that I just did, where I did update all, um, but we're going to ignore that for now, we'll pretend it didn't happen. The important thing is the, um, where is that? The I see, and it doesn't keep it in. Are there? I don't know. I see one. Dpack. Oh, I'm not sure where it is. But over time, what will happen is that as you add 3D models in the libraries that are referenced in your design, um, and that's why some of these others have started to uh, to gain parts. The um, I can't see where that. W5100 is. Anyway, I will just hit push and we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> as you add parts to the libraries with 3D models, and then you update your project with the latest version from the libraries, those little those lines will go to green ticks, which means um, <laughs> Martin says it's always a network. Yeah, uh, which means that there is a 3D model associated with the part and then when it does the synchronization to fusion those models are going to go along for the ride and once this finishes we can close that and switch back to fusion 360 and this is the version that we were looking at up until we started making all these hacks around in the library and it's out of date but what i'm going to do and you can see over here data in this folder has been updated refresh so i'll refresh that I've got to close this version of the model, open the refreshed version, and now we should start to have some parts for our, or some models for our parts. And you can see because of those other updates, uh, we've now got some capacitors and um, there's a, an IC over here, there's an SO8 IC. Um, we have the, uh, the big chip in the middleware which is the, the WizNet chip. And it's starting to look more like a physical representation. Okay. Let's go back to Eagle and start applying some changes. Now, I've just taken a very long time to show you adding a model for one part. And um, it, as I said, it can seem very laborious. It's not necessarily that laborious for other parts. And um, one, when you have jelly bean parts, you know, resistors and capacitors and all of that sort of thing, it can be very quick to go through and replace them. So let's, uh, let's do that. Now, in my managed libraries, well, I've got... Um, this managed library here. I'm just going to close that because we don't want to keep editing that for now. And uh, what I can do is go through and use parts that I've already defined in other libraries and do part replacement in here. Now I can pick replace and I'm going to start low hanging fruit. I'm just going to replace all the 0603 resistors. So I'm going to go into the Superhouse Discrete Semi um, Library Resistor 0603 and you can see the little icon here which means it's got a 3D model associated with it. Okay, so I'm now in the replacement tool and all over this board there are 0603 resistors. Like there's one there, so I'll click on that one. Um, these, are the, these are resistor arrays, so I won't replace those in this operation. But if I come over, uh, where are we? Over here. 
there are some 0603 parts. I'll click those to replace them. Those ones, that's part of a resistor array. There's a discrete 0603, click that one. Uh, these two, <coughs> and that one up here. So this is just a, um, a matter of going around the board and replacing any parts that you already have models for. And um, I might have missed a couple, but that's probably most of them. Now I'm going to replace a different part. I'm going to pick uh, cap 0603. I think there are some 0603 caps around here. There's um, uh, this one there. There's a couple of 13 picofarad 0603s on the, um, the crystal. There's a 100 nanofarad one there. So 10 nanofarad one there. 100 down here. Oh, some more hundreds. Hundreds. They're sprinkled all over the design. Like confetti. Um, lots of clicking through. Doesn't look like anything is changing on the schematic because the representation on the schematic is exactly the same as what it was before. But what it's doing is updating the part in the design to reference the um, the alternative library instead of wherever the part was coming from previously. And I might have missed a couple, but now if I go into replace again and Pick, this time I'm going to pick LEDs and ooh hello no I'm going to leave LEDs for now I'm going to come back to that because there's a little complication with that and I'll show you these simple things first so I'll save that and we'll go back into the board layout you have to be in board layout in order to push diffusion and I'm going to do a push again push and you can see now that there are many many more green ticks in here as we go down we'll see that a lot of the capacitors have been replaced you can also see that I've missed some for example in here it's got C17 28 and 22 and 17 and 22 have got ticks next to them and their footprint is called C0603 but C28 <clears throat> I obviously missed that just as I was clicking around on the board we'll ignore that for now we'll click on push and this time, just to show you what it does, once it begins this process, you can hide this dialogue and go back to working in your design. So I'll click on hide, and then you could be in your design doing whatever you need to do. In fact, I'm gonna go back to the schematic, <clears throat> and when it's finished, it'll push up a little dialogue saying, hey, I've done the sync, and it's all ready. So what I could be doing now is going on with making other changes, try to find uh, wherever that capacitor was that um, uh, that I forgot to change. So it says it's been successfully pushed. Okay, switch back to Fusion 360, close the out of date version, refresh, and you get very used to doing this dance. It's, um, you do the same thing over and over again. And then we'll update the, uh, the model. So opening the new Ether 10 model, and now a whole lot of parts have started to appear on the board. If we zoom in, uh, if I can, what's going on with my, uh, my keys in Fusion are a bit messed up at the moment. So we can see now that there are these resistors on the board here. Um, there are some capacitors in place and it's, once again, it's, um, it's making progress. It's starting to look more like a physical representation of the board, not just a PCB with a bunch of polygons sitting on top of it. Now, there are a couple of parts we can replace that will make, that will visually have a fairly dramatic effect. Um, for example, the DC jack. This is a cool one. Um, this part in here is the 2.1 millimeter DC jack and I have a footprint for that that has a, um, a very nice 3D model. So if I come into here and I go power jack with slots and I'll replace that part. And I'll also replace this, uh, this diode. So replace and where are we? 
I want Superhouse Discrete Semi. There we go. Diode SMA, which is the model for the one in 4004. Replace that. And now we'll do the dance again. We'll go back, oops, go back to the board. Back to here. Loading, push diffusion, blah, blah, blah. Oh, while I'm here, I'm just going to have a quick look at, um, well, actually, no, before I even push, because pushing takes time, I'm going to replace a couple of other parts. And back in the schematic, I'm going to replace the main headers for the Arduino. Uh, so here, for example, we can see the, the parts that are used to represent the, the shield headers. And I'm going to replace um, this six-way header down here, the analog inputs. And um, something is going to go wrong here, as you'll see in just a moment, because the part that I'm about to replace it with has a different origin point. So in connectors, I'm going to pick an M06, and I want a socket. Now, I have multiple versions of this part with different 3D models associated with it. For example, I have this one, which has the, uh, the header socket, and I have the same footprint, exactly the same, but with the pin header model associated with it. I'm going to replace it with a version with the socket, and if I click on this part, we'll see it all go wrong. And by replacing it, I've now moved the part, it's offset, the origin is wrong, um, so I've now got to click on that and move that part back into place and fix the location of the, um, the designators and things. And then it's okay. And now I'm going to do a replacement on the eight pin headers as a socket. I'll replace that one and that one. And then I'm gonna fix their positions once again Bring that back up, and bring this one back down to there, and where's the designator for that one? I don't even know where it's gone, oh maybe it's not visible. Anyway, uh, then I'll replace the 10 pin header with the socket version right there. Grab the move tool. Uh, where is it? There. There's the um, digital. And where's the designator? There it is. Everything's moved around. Not necessarily the neatest, but um, it should be pretty much back to the way it looked in the schematic before. So I'll save it, go back to board, and now we'll do the push dance. Push. And everyone take another drink from the vodka. <clears throat> what I find is that when I'm doing this process, there are a few parts that have a really big visual uh, impact and in fact they're probably the ones that matter the most because in terms of the mechanical model and how you fit this into um, other um, other parts of a design it's things like the connectors and um, buttons and that sort of stuff that really matter a lot of the time things like the jelly bean parts you don't care about they're just tiny little things on the PCB and um, it's not going to impact how the PCB fits into a case. But the big things, the connectors in particular, because they need external apertures, are very important. So what I do typically is go through and replace physically large parts like connectors, and um, I'll replace the jelly bean parts like resistors just because they're already in the library, they're there. It's just a matter of going part replace, click, 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 and you're done. And most of the time, that process will get you a very long way there. Now, we can already see, for example, that this is starting to look like a problem.
proper 3D representation of the board, there are obviously some major things that are missing, but we have the, um, the shield headers in place. There is the 2.1mm power socket, and that's uh, quite a nice model, so you can see the little spring inside that pushes against the side of the barrel connector. Um, we can see that the, uh, the pins for the socket come down through the slots in the PCB. Um, we can check the header alignments and all of those sorts of things. <clears throat> and um, in a, a lot of the time, the amount of effort that we've put into this already is going to be enough. Uh, although, obviously, we want the RJ45 socket to be on here as well, um, and the USB socket, because those are important things in terms of external connections. But a lot of the time, things like um, crystals or... Uh, or resistors, you don't really care about that much. It's not worth the effort of going to to um, add all of those things. Uh, because I already have models for most of those things, it's only a couple of extra minutes to click through and add all of those parts. So let's just add a couple more things. Oh, um, actually while I'm here, uh, one thing that's interesting to know is the, the bi-directional link between um, Fusion and Eagle. Not just pushing from Eagle to Fusion, but then pulling information back the other way. <clears throat> now, what we've got here are boxes that represent undefined parts, and we also have things like the, uh, the outline of the PCB. And inside Fusion, there is a specific uh, component type, which is a PCB, and right down the bottom here, we can see it's Ether 10 PCB component is showing in our um, design history. And it knows to treat that geometry as a PCB. So we can make changes to the PCB outline in here directly in Fusion. And then um, when we're back in Eagle, we can pull from Fusion and the layout will update. Uh, I might get back to that later. I'm not sure. This is already uh, taking a really long time to show even uh, fairly basic stuff, so that might have to be for another time. But let's do something a little bit more interesting and look at how you would take a model for a more complicated part, like an RJ45 socket, uh, from somewhere like GrabCAD or wherever it's available, and then map that in. So we have this RJ45 socket in here, and at the moment it's just a box. Oh, and also I should mention that you can turn these off. What happens is that there is this default uh, polygon that comes through that represents where that part would be, but um, it can be really ugly and sometimes you don't even want to associate a 3D part with a particular uh, thing in the design. So you can just hide it in Fusion. If we spin down the PCB component, we can see all the little subcomponents in here and as you move over them, they'll be highlighted on the design. And so say we wanted to hide this big red ugly thing because we weren't going to replace it. We just want to make it go away. So you can select it and then in um, on the list on the left, it's underlined to show that that is the particular one. There's a little light bulb to show whether it's visible and you can just turn it off. So for objects that you don't necessarily want to be represented you can um, you can select them in here go in here turn it off turn off the micro sd card so now when you're looking around on the design you don't have those objects uh, jumping in and out of visibility and um, being visual noise it uh, that way you just see the objects that you've already um, that you've already got models associated with okay so Let's have some fun and stick this RJ45 socket on there. To do that, we are going to go back into Eagle and I'm going to go into Library Manager. Now, this is an interesting part of the workflow that also tripped me up. So what we're gonna do is open Library Manager because this particular RJ45 socket, I don't currently have a model for this. This is totally unrehearsed and 
I don't even know if I can find a model for it, but we'll just have to see what happens. And I want to add that part and that library to my connectors library. So if I have a look in Superhouse Connectors and select it and click Edit, um, this is my list of uh, connectors that I have in the library at the moment. I only created this library about a week ago and it has a few in it so far, but not all that many. So what we're going to do is with that library open, and remember it has to be open, uh, we go back to the schematic and find where that RJ45 socket is. So this particular uh, library part, this is one that I designed many, many years ago um, based on the hand-run RJ45 socket. So I sketched all of this out back when I was um, doing the original Ether 10 design. And I want to add this. So at the moment, it's probably sitting in a Freetronics library. Let's have a look. It is in, oh, Freetronics John. Yeah. So that hand run, in fact, I'm going to copy that part number. I'm just going to stick that in my clipboard for now. We're going to come back to it in just a second. So what I'm going to do is right click on that part, copy device to library. Now, this is why you need to have that library open. If you don't have a library open, you can't copy the device to it, and there's no way of selecting what library to copy to. It just assumes that you have one library open, and if you copy it to a library, that's where it's going to put it. So if we now come back to our Manage Library, you can see that it's created this new part, and it's now in here. So I'm going to edit this description. I'm just going to say, Hanrun RJ45 socket, and put the part number in there. And it's copied over um, everything associated with the part in terms of its physical footprint and its schematic. And it's got its um, pin bindings and everything. It's all moved across. Um, showing you how to create parts from scratch is a bit out of scope of what I'm going to cover in this video. Um, but that's how you would associate pins if you were generating this from scratch. So we'll go back to our table of contents, which shows our whole library. And we've got the devices, we've got the physical footprints, 3D packages, and the symbols. And the devices bind those other three things together. And this is another area where um, I fell into a hole and I spent hours trying to figure this out. So hopefully this will save some of you some time. Um, it's currently unsaved, as well as you would be able to see down there if my face wasn't in the way. So it's unsaved, it's got uh, a local uh, change which hasn't been saved yet. So I'm just going to hit save. Now, there is a, um, let's see, oh that's different, okay. I was confused because I thought, hang on, it's created a part when it shouldn't, but it doesn't. All right, so if we go back here to the HY931147C, which is our hand-run Ethernet jack, when you select a part on the left or a device on the left, it highlights all of the associated entries in the footprints, the packages, and the symbols. So you can see what is used to constitute that part. So if I click on ICSP, for example, well, let's just look at a simpler example. Um, M02, which is a two-pin um, header, has three different footprints. You can see they're highlighted here. It's got three different 3D packages and it's got one symbol because the symbol looks the same in the schematic whether you're putting on a pin header or a socket or just leaving it as bare pads. But if we look at the part that we just copied in, the hand run part, it's got the footprint on here, which is fine. That's the physical representation. And it's got the symbol on here, which is good. It's going to be represented in the schematic but there's nothing in the 3D packages. And you'll notice actually that there is a line missing in here. Under 3D packages, the list finishes one item fewer than there are footprints. And that's usually a warning sign. So if we now select this again, we can see we've got footprint, symbol, no 3D package. And this is where I fell into the hole, similar to what I was talking about way back at the start when we created the empty library and then uh, needed to 
create the managed version and then synchronize it before we could start associating things. And that is because down here in the corner, you can see it's got this little blue D, which is managed draft locally modified. And that is the problem. Um, once again, I spent ages looking through this going, import 3D package. I want to add a 3D package, add from web, create with package generator. How do I add a step file? And you will look forever. You will never find the menu item because it isn't there. The only way that you can now add a, um, a design, a 3D model using a step file to this package is to create a new remote version and synchronize it back down again. Now watch this magic. We've got this list here, which ends one item short on this side. I'm gonna go up to library, create new version. Yes, 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 create. So it's now taking the local changes, which includes adding that RJ45 socket, and it's pushing it up to the Autodesk cloud service and then synchronizing it back down again so that the two will be exactly the same. And magically, this list just got one element longer. And that is the thing that allows you to now add a step file to this design. So if we now click on the HY device over here, the hand run device, we've got the footprint, we've got the symbol. We also have a 3D package, which has just been created as part of the process. I think what's happening behind the scenes here is that when you synchronize with the cloud service, the cloud service says, hey, I've, I'm receiving this information. I've got a footprint, I've got a symbol, I've got a device, but I've got a null value or an undefined 3D package. So I'm gonna create one. And it generates a default 3D package, which just represents the physical outlines of the device. It gives it the same name as the footprint, which is why we can see here, it says the, um, the 3D package is called HY931147C and then it gets synchronized back down again onto your local copy. So we now have a local copy which has an auto-generated 3D model. But until that auto-generated model exists, we can't add one or edit one. Once you know that step, it all becomes much easier. Um, okay, so now we have this 3D model and we want to edit it. So I'll double click on it and it will open up the, um, the little online editor, the package generator. And in this package generator, we have already looked at the add model option um, very briefly. I didn't actually do it, but that's to associate a model that you already have. Um, we've looked at the generate model option, which is for standard parts like um, ICs and, and other things that it knows or, it has an internal understanding of the geometry of, so you can just put in the values and it, it generates the model for you. What we're gonna do here is upload step, but first we need a step file. So let's see if we can find one. And I'm gonna go back into uh, my browser. First thing I do is just do a search for the part number. And um, if you do an image search for it, you may strike it lucky and just see a 3D model appear there somewhere in the search results. Um, usually what you need to do is, oh, that's interesting, it looks like someone has taken my, oh, maybe not, it looked like someone had taken my um, schematic for that part and used it, which is cool. So I'm gonna search for that with 3D model. And can we find any 3D models? None of them immediately jump out at me. Now the things to look for here are results on GrabCAD, uh, which is a good site for getting lots of 3D models of things. And there are a couple of other sites as well, but I find that in general, uh, GrabCAD is where a whole lot of stuff comes from. And just scroll down through there. I don't see any really obvious things. Now, for something like a, um, a magjack like this, where it's basically a rectangle, like a rectangular block, um, 
you can fudge it. If you just want to have a representation of how it's going to fit on the board and you don't necessarily care about verifying that the pins go through exactly the holes and that sort of thing, you can associate a model for another part that is not the exact same part that you're using. Uh, it's kind of, yeah, but you can do it. We might have to do it in this case, we're just going to have to see. So let's have a look at grabcad. Com. and I'm going to go to community library and you'll see if you haven't seen GrabCAD before it's amazing there are um, there are designs for all sorts of crazy things that you can then download in uh, different formats what we want is step file but to start with I'm just going to do a search for the part number and it says no CAD models found that's all right, let's try a more general search. The thing is that there are so many very specific um, parts that it's quite likely that we won't find um, that exact part, but if we can find a part that is physically fairly close, we can whack it on the board and get some idea of how it all fits together. Now I've just done a search for hand run, which is a manufacturer of that part, <clears throat> and there is one model that we found. Now I could use this one, in fact it's quite likely that I'm going to come back to this. It's a totally different part, it's surface mount, it's got tabs on here. Uh, it's not through hole, which the one I'm using is, but we could put this in its place and it would be a reasonable physical representation even if the pins don't line up. But let's just go back and do a search for RJ45 socket PCB, let's see if it comes up with anything. Only that one. Let's just try RJ45 socket. And there's nothing much that is looking like what we want. So, whoa, hang on. What's this one? Halo RJ45 socket. <clears throat> this looks reasonably close to, um, uh, it's not quite the same, but it is reasonably close physically to the socket that I have on the board. Uh, the one I'm using has LEDs in it, and this one doesn't. But it's a through-hole part, uh, and that is probably close enough. So what we can do here is have a look for the step file. Now at the moment, Eagle can only import step files as 3D models. You can't bring in Fusion 360 projects or anything else. So what I'm going to do is just click on the, um, the 3D model for that, click on download file, and I will now have the step file for this 3D model. And it's called Halo RJ45 socket. Just gotta remember that because we're going to need to know it in just a moment. So let's go back into Eagle. Now that we've found the model we want to apply to this particular part, we come into here and click on upload step, and I'm gonna go into downloads, and find Halo RJ45, which is the step file we just downloaded. Select it. And this is taking the step file from my local computer and pushing it to the AutoCAD, AutoCAD Cloud service so that it can convert that into a model that it can use within the, uh, within the library. Uh, it says loading 3D model. Oh, look at this, the um, orientation is all off. But if we click and spin around this now, we'll see that the model is hanging down there in space underneath the board. Oh, right down there, okay. Um, it's off in multiple axes and it's offset as well. So we can fix that by, firstly, let's rotate it this way so that it aligns with the way it's actually meant to align. And then I'm going to rotate it that way to bring it up above the board and then slide it up on the z-axis and uh, let's just rotate so that we can see where it's it's going um, and it will sit somewhere around about there just above the PCB and I'll grab the, the this other axis handle slide it along and get it so that it fits pretty much over the footprint. 
Now that's amazingly, that is mechanically very similar to the part that I'm using. You can see that the pins on the back come through the holes in the footprint, the mounting tabs come through. This is a better match than I was expecting. So I haven't got it in quite the right position. If you look at the pins through the holes, they're slightly forward now. So I'll just grab this little red handle, slide it back a fraction. Let's check the position. Needs a little bit more. Grab the red handle, slide it back. And it's now fairly well aligned with the footprint. Now you can see on the footprint, it's got these other holes in the front where other pins are meant to come through and there aren't any other pins. So that is where the LED connections go through. For the socket that I'm using, it looks like it's mechanically pretty much identical. It's just that it's got LEDs and um, this model doesn't have those connections. Now, interestingly, this doesn't actually matter. Now, if you, if you wanted to, you could have uploaded a step file for a unicorn and associated it with this part. And you would generate your PCB, pull it in Fusion, and there'd be a little unicorn sitting where your RJ45 socket is meant to be. It doesn't care. This is simply a representation physically of what is there. So there's no, it has no concept in the 3D model that these are electrical pins and that they need to be associated with certain pads. This is just a representation physically of what is going to sit at that location on the PCB. All right, so this has gone pretty well. I'm quite happy with this. Now that we have um, put that step file in place, it's converted it. Now down in the bottom right, which you will just be able to see, is the little OK button. I'm going to click OK, and it gives you an option for entering a thing. It's like a commit message, basically. Created in Eagle. So I'm just going to hit OK. <laughs> it's like doing a git commit minus M changes. Yeah, <laughs> very useful. But anyway, that has now associated it. And once again, we're back in the state where the library says drawing was modified and we need to now push that back to the cloud service. So I'll save that, go to library, create new version, create, and we'll let it do its thing. So at the start of this little bit of the process, as I showed you, there was no 3D model associated with this part and we needed to um, create a new version and resynchronize with the cloud version, the cloud service for that part to magically appear. And um, it's now done that. So you, what you'll get into the habit of is going library new version all the time. It's, um, I don't think there's any particular downside to it as far as I know. You can create a new version every 10 minutes if you want to. But what I find is that as I'm editing things, when I make changes, whenever I make a local change, I'll save locally and then library new version and um, make sure that everything is synchronized. So now let's see what happens. If we click on the hand run part over here, it is now showing a 3D model. So we've got the schematic, we've got the footprint, and we have the 3D model that represents it. So, Let's come back down into our schematic and I'm going to go replace and find Superhouse connectors and HR, etc. the hand run part. Okay, and click on that. Oh, John's heading off. Okay, see you, John. Thanks for coming along. And so I've now replaced that part. Once again, visually nothing changed in the schematic because the representation of the symbol is exactly the same in the new library as it was in the old library. And if we come along to the board, once again, it all still fits. But I'll save that and then do push to fusion. And this should uh, give us a bit more of a dramatic change in the fusion model with that IJ45 socket appearing in place. And um, once we get back into Fusion, I will show you something that I did fudging a USB socket by using the wrong model. Just showing that it can still be useful even if you don't have the exact correct model. 
So sinking, like the time. All right, it's pushed. So we'll go back to Fusion. Close that version. <clears throat> and you see here there is no RJ45 socket on it. I'll close it. I don't want to save. I'll refresh the local projects. Open the Ether 10. And let's see what it looks like. Alrighty, so now we have a model that includes the RJ45 socket. And that very much is starting to look like a proper Ether 10. Still a few parts missing, but it's, um, it's a very good 3D representation now of how that board fits together. And if you look at the bottom of the board, we can see that the um, stakes and the pins and things for that RJ45 socket are coming through the holes and it's all nicely aligned. So we've gone, it's taken a while, because I've been doing way too much talking, but we've gone from a board that was just a, a flat uh, representation of the PCB a little while ago to now having a PCB that has uh, many of these parts in the managed library and many of the parts have 3D representations. So let's just change a couple more parts. I think I've probably shown you mostly enough to get the idea of, um, of how this works, but I'm just going to change, uh, I'm going to do a couple more parts. I'm going to change one part using an existing model, um, one part by adding a step file, and one part using the model generator, and just run through those three different options again so that you can see uh, what happens. But before I do that, I'm going to show you how I fudged this thing in the ES prog with this other little part. So this is the, um, the ESP programming adapter that I've just been working on and it's got a USB-C connector on there. Now if you look at the representation here, this all seems fine uh, and it is actually a, an accurate representation of where the USB-C connector will sit, but there are some things that are wrong. I couldn't find a model of the connector that I um, wanted to use, that I am using on this project. So I just grabbed a model, a step file for a USB-C socket that has the same physical outlines, but the pin uh, and the mounting arrangement is totally different. So it just doesn't align at all. And what I did was I uploaded the step file, I aligned it over the footprint so that the outside dimensions of the part are in the right place and totally ignored the fact that the pins didn't match up. So the result is that now if we um, come into this model and look closely, you'll see that the um, there is a stake here on the side of the socket and it doesn't go through the hole where the stake is meant to go. And if we spin around underneath the board, oops, uh, how do I move this? You'll see there are no pins coming through these holes. And in fact, um, the, what I'm using is a hybrid part, which is half through hole and half surface mount. And this particular model is for a fully um, surface mount part. So if I uh, come in, let's see if I can do this. I'll find the board. I'll just turn the board off. Okay, so the board is now invisible. Actually, no, this is a hybrid part. It's just a different hybrid part. So if we look at the bottom of this particular model, we can see it's got the surface mount pins along the back here. It's got the, um, the through hole parts here, but um, that is a different geometry to the, um, the particular connector that I've used. And the result is that it doesn't align with any of these, but that's okay. Because as I said, it's not a, um, a representation of the the electrical connections, once you get everything into fusion, what we're looking at here is the, the physical representation, not the electrical representation. So as long as that socket is in the correct place and the clearances are all correct and, the, um, and it shows where it's going to stick off the edge of the board, that's enough to then allow you to design a case around this and, and have everything fit. So, that's cool. 
Uh, I mean, it's not ideal. And some point I will probably model the exact socket that I use um, so that I can make that accurate just because it bugs me. But, you know, you can live without it. It's, it's still enough. If you, um, if you just look at this, like we jump back to the home position around to here, this is still a pretty good physical representation of the PCB and how everything fits. So it's up to you if you want to be obsessive about it or not. Um, in this case, we got lucky and we got a step file that was almost the same as, um, as what we're looking at. All right, so I'm going to start by replacing these crystals because I already have parts with models for the crystals. I might replace the um, ICSP headers as well, just because that's so easy. And um, then we'll go on to the other types of replacement, do a quick recap, and I think that'll be about it. Now, we want to go to schematic. So what we're going to do here is replace the, um, where are we? Over in the schematic. Okay, there are a couple of ICSP headers here. And I have ICSP headers defined with um, with pins for models in my connectors library. So I've actually got specifically, it's not, you can just use a generic two by three header, but I've specifically got um, a model for ICSP. And this one is the two by three with pin headers version. So I select that, I'm gonna go replace, replace. Oh, and you can see that it jumps sideways because the origin is not quite in the same spot. And there was a third one of those headers somewhere, I think. Or was it only two? No, I think it might have only been two. Okay, so I've replaced both of those headers. And I'll also replace the crystals. So I'll go into, out of the connectors and into the oscillators library crystal. And I want the HC49 and I'll replace that one and that one and there is one over here somewhere associated with the there it is 25 megahertz crystal associated with the ethernet ic so we've now replaced a couple of those actually while i'm here where is the um the protection on the there we go. A couple of other parts that I happen to know that I have models for. So it's very quick. Uh, oscillators, I'm going to go into discrete semi and TVS. This is a, um, a protection Zener that's used on USB connections and I'm going to replace it. So at the moment, in the original design, what I've got here is <coughs> the little protection Zeners and I just put down a footprint for a resistor and then set the value to be um, the Zener uh, part number because I didn't really have I didn't have a footprint and I didn't I couldn't be bothered making one or something. So what I'm going to do is I'll replace that part with the specific part that I have now for the Zener, and you can see the symbol has changed. And I'll replace the other one with the Zener part as well. And um, just to space this out a bit more nicely, give it a bit of room. Uh, I'm also going to replace this polyfuse, so I'll pick that one, discrete semi, where I've got a fuses library, which is this one, with a polyfuse, and it's a um, 0.5 amp polyfuse, so it's that one in an 1812 package, and I go boink, and I want the 0.05, oh, and the orientation is all wrong. So sometimes this happens and you have to come in and fix things. But that's okay. Sometimes the, um, the geometry of the part that you're replacing is not the same as what it was before. So now let's go back into the board and make sure that nothing has really screwed up too much. Um, what can be dangerous is if the origin of your parts is on the footprints on the PCB is different because by replacing it, you can make parts jump around on the board and clearances can get screwed up and you can have all sorts of problems. But you can see here that the, um, 
that's the PCC that I just replaced. The orientation is still correct. And I think orientation on everything else is correct. Uh, in fact, what I'll do now is I'll replace parts, whoops, I'll replace parts that I know are going to screw up and uh, we'll fix them, we'll fix the footprint on the board. So I'm going to replace LEDs. There we go, LEDs. I'm going to put in some 0603 LEDs. And we've got yellow and green LEDs in here for the um, USB activity. So I'm going to click on those to replace those parts. Can't see any change once again. If we go into the board, I think this will have messed up. Let's see. Where are those LEDs? Uh, yes, there they are, up in the corner of the board. You can see that these LEDs now I'll, um, have rotated. This, there's stuff overlapping, it's all nasty and horrible. It's all a big mess. So, we need to fix that. What it's done is the, the rotation of the LED footprint was 90 degrees out from what was there previously. So the LED should be going left and right here, and now it's going vertically, which means that it's protruding into where the wire is. We've got tracks overlapping, it's horrible. So what I'm gonna do is just select that footprint, and I'm gonna change the angle. Um, 270, I think. I've gotta make it go zero. Let's just change that hip line and see what happens. Yep, that fixed it. So it was 90 degrees out, and you can see now that the tracks are back to going where they should be, and everything is oriented. Now one trap here, the reason I'm specifically showing you this example is that it can be tempting to try to fix this by moving the part and rotating it. It doesn't work. Well, it can work if you were, if the part is positioned exactly on the grid. And I'll show you what happens. So I've just got the select tool. So I'm gonna grab this part here and you, know, you can drag it around and move it. And if you right click, Oh, amazingly, this one was on the grid, so it worked. Um, if you right-click it, you can rotate the part, so um, it'll end up back in the correct orientation. Actually, I think it might be slightly offset. Not sure. Let's undo that. So this is back into its broken state. But what can happen is if your part wasn't quite on the grid, it can rotate not around its center point, but around an offset point, which means that instead of just rotating on the spot, it might step around sideways and then things just get worse. So what I normally do in this situation is I use the info tool and select the part and then just change the angle like that. And that way it rotates exactly around its origin instead of rotating based on grid settings and other things. So it ends up all good. So those two LEDs are fixed. Now, if we go back to the schematic, I'm just gonna do the, um, the part replacement on LEDs on some other LEDs on the board. Uh, well, there's a whole bunch of them here. So we can just go bang, 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 bang. Oh, and the last one. And now if we go back into the board, we'll have a whole bunch of broken LEDs all the way over here, I think they are. Yes, there they are. So now they're all aligned vertically when they should be horizontally. So once again, we're gonna go from 90 degrees to, I think we add 90, so make it 180, and probably have to do the same on each of these. So from 90 degrees, make it 180, and Almost done. Okay, so we fixed the orientation of all the LEDs. Read rat's nest, rip up and see the board. Now we've replaced the crystals. These ones here, I dropped in, that had an existing model. We've replaced the LEDs, we've fixed the footprints. So now there are um, uh, a couple more things we should replace. Let's see. 
we did a micro SD card, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's just save this, sync it, push it through, and see how much progress we're making. Now, <clears throat> if we look at this little sync dialog, you'll see that there are far more green ticks now. So we've got 3D packages for most of the things on this board. And uh, a lot of that is just bulk replacements. It's resistors and capacitors and things. We don't have models for the K16s yet, which are the, um, the little resistor networks or resistor arrays. So we'll push this and then we'll replace parts using a couple of the other techniques. Do, 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 do. Vodka. <clears throat> Come on. Sink, sink, sink. Now, obviously, in order to do this, you need to be online. You can make local changes, um, and it's totally usable offline. It's just that you can't sync um, things back up to the cloud service in order to pull them back down to Fusion. Uh, so it does mean you have a dependence on the remote service, but there are trade-offs. Features are pretty cool. All right, so now this is out of date again. Close that. Data in this folder has been updated, refresh. So we'll click refresh, we'll open the new project, which we can see now is up to version seven. So we've pushed it a few times. And now we're starting to see some more models in there. You can see that the crystals have appeared because they were in my library. They already had models associated with them. And if we zoom in, you can see LEDs. So there are little representations of the LEDs on the circuit board now. Um, this is where the resistor networks or resistor arrays go, and we don't have models for those. Um, oh yeah, and the ICSP headers, they're in place. You can see it's actually got pins now where those headers go. And let's... Um, make a couple more changes back in Eagle. All right, so back to schematic and we'll finish off with two things. I'm going to add a model for the resistor networks and I'm going to add a model for the SD card. So the way to do that, just to refresh your memory, is we've got the connectors library here um, I'll close that, go into Open Library Manager, and I want the discrete semi because this is where I'm going to put the resistor networks. So I'll select it, edit. Now with the library open, remember you've got to have it open. I'm going back into the schematic, find one of the resistor networks. There it is. Right click, copy device to library, back to the library, and Boom, we've got ourselves a resistor network. So I'll just save that, go back to the table of contents. And now, once again, we're in the situation where we can't add 3D models because we don't have uh, entries in here. So now we go back into library, create new version, create, and this is pushing back up and it's going to generate default packages for uh, those 3D objects. And then we'll be able to replace them. And I think that there is a resistor network um, model generator built into Eagle. I haven't actually seen this, um, but let's just go in. I want to find out which package is being used. So the device is a 4R NK16, which means it's four resistors um, in that package. And back to the library, 4RN, and there is a K16. We've got a couple of K16s here. We've got some doubling up. Oh, there's a CAT16 and a K16. Okay, so we've got K16, and this is the 
object, which is currently represented by the default big box, double click it, and we should be able to use the, um, the built-in package generator to make a representation of this resistor array. So we'll do generate model, and over on here, well, look at this, we've got uh, several different types of chip array. This is interesting. I haven't used this particular model generator before. <clears throat> There's a chip array two side convex, chip array two side flat concave, and chip array four side flat concave. Now, which one is this? I'm pretty sure that it's this one, two side flat concave. So I'm going to select that. Now, one thing you'll notice as you're using the model generators is that some of them serve multiple purposes. For example, the chip, like if I just go back here for a moment, see this little chip generator. Um, by chip, it doesn't mean integrated circuit. It means uh, like a rectangle with a couple of connections on it. And it's got different component families. So you can create a resistor, a fuse, an inductor, a LED, whatever because they all follow the same basic geometry and the model generator allows you to create different types of things and then that just affects a little bit of how it's physically represented like what material it uses to um, to show it. So what we're going to do is go into this one and we can make this little um, array can make resistors, inductors, diodes, capacitors. We want to make a resistor, 8 pins, concave, um, I don't know what these dimensions are meant to be, so once again, I just leave everything default, hit update preview, let it generate its model, and then we can see whether we're on or whether we're crazy out of spec and um, how close it's going to be. <clears throat> All right, now that looks like it's way wrong. So firstly, I'm just going to spin it around, but you can see if I slide it back out of the way, it is way too big for that particular uh, type of resistor. <clears throat> so I just need to figure out probably just the pitch and the width is enough. So this is um, a 1.27 millimeter pitch and it's eight pin. So let's go back to, oh, what is this? It's a K16. Um, let's have a look for some dimensions. Born, oh, is it born or borns? I can't remember. Resistor array. Uh, K16 dimensions. Here we go. That looks like the one that I'm using. I think. Yeah, something like that. Let's find some actual geometry for this. In fact, I think it's born with an E. Let's get rid of that and just have a look for dimensions. Born series. Uh, I think I might actually be using the wrong model because the type I want, if I look at an, a physical board with a resistor array on it, I've got a Need the 10 right here. Then, yeah, the resistor array, I, I think I've got the wrong model selected in Eagle. So let's go back. Instead of the chip array two-sided bar, I think it's this one. Resistor, it's going to be eight pins. Once again, let's just update the model <clears throat> and see if its defaults make sense. That seems to be a bit closer, at least. Um, the body length is a bit long. Now, a lot of the time you can just fudge this D. So the D dimension is saying it's 3.2 to 3.4 millimeters. Let's change it to say 2.8 to 3 millimeters. Regenerate, and we'll just see what happens. Oh, and the width I think is wrong as well. E uh, is the E dimension. It's 1.8 to 2.4. Let's make it 1.2 to 1.6, just because I can see that it's physically too big there. And we'll probably end up getting a bit closer to what the model should look like. Wow. 
It's heading in the right direction at least. Uh, let's move it into place that way. Uh, you can see that the pin spacing is not quite right. So let's see, what is the spacing on this one? The V1 dimension, it's got a longer pin on the end. Well, let's make V1 the same as V. So it's got 0 0.3 to 0.4, and I'll make that 0.3 to 0.4. Now I'm kind of, I'm fudging this just for the sake of getting this done for the video. Um, if I was being pedantic about this, I'd be looking up all the specs and get the exact dimensions. But most of the time, this will get you a fair way. Now the space between the pins, E being the pitch, is currently a little bit low. Saying it's 0.64 millimeters, let's make it 0.8 millimeters. Update preview and see how close we are to having it fit on that footprint. That is actually looking pretty damn good. That is now fitting physically into the space of where the footprint needs to be. The, um, the pads are aligning. I think that's good enough. So let's just hit finish. Except yes, update the package name with all of those crazy IPC spec things again. And we should now be able to put down that um, on the board have it start looking like it should on the 3D model. Uploading, uploading, uploading. A whole lot of time spent waiting for these things to happen. And now once that's finished, we'll do the dance again. We'll save locally. We now have a locally saved draft. We'll go library, create new version, create, push, synchronize, pull back down, wait. And then we'll have our nicely updated library. So now we can go back into our uh, schematic. I'll do a replace and I'll find superhouse discrete semi. We should now have 4RN. So that's the, um, the resistor array. The NK16 is the one we want. And we can see the little symbol there that shows it's got a 3D model. Select that and I'll res replace that resistor array, that resistor array, where else are there? Um, oh, there's a network up there. I'm not sure if I'll get them all. Oh, there's more over here. But this is, uh, this is just a matter of iterating through this now and progressively replacing parts. I've really, I've shown you everything you need to know at this point. I'm kind of just recapping and um, doing more of the same of what I've already shown you. Um, but if we now save that, go into board and push this again, push to fusion. Uh, yeah, most of the parts are there now. They've got 3D models. And let that do its thing. Like up. It's a good thing I don't actually drink. Well, not much anyway. <clears throat> Water and soft drink is about as hard as it gets. <clears throat> Otherwise, Eagle would turn me into an alcoholic. Come on. Okay, pushed. Close. So many dialogues to acknowledge. What am I doing? So we'll head back to Fusion. Uh, reset view. So close that. Refresh. Open. And now we've got our updated model. And you can see in here that we now have resistor networks represented on the PCB as well. And it's really starting to look like more of a, um, a complete 3D model now. Still a few things missing. So the very last thing that I'm going to do 
before I... Oh, look, there's a... Um, oh, no, I thought there was a resistor array missing, but... Yeah, there is. There's meant to be a resistor array there. I think there's another one up there. So there are a couple I missed when I was um, messing around in the... Uh, in the schematic, doing replacements, but that's okay. I can just patch them up. At this point, it's just a matter of looping through this over and over again, and each time you do it, you'll see more and more green ticks in the little push uh, dialog, and you just keep going until you've got rid of all of the, uh, the unreferenced 3D models, and you've got 3D models for all the parts. So let's do the SD card. And I'm going to finish off with that because um, that's demonstrating again how to use the, hopefully, using the, um, the step file uh, version. So I don't want to put that into the discrete semi library. I want to put that into the, what should I put it into? I suppose it's a connector. That makes the most sense, doesn't it? It's definitely not an IC. So let's put it into the connectors library. Select connectors, edit have that open and now we'll go to our schematic view and find the SD card slot which is right here right click copy device to library we've seen this a dozen times now and then we'll go back into our library now we've got our SD card slot um, and go back into here save <coughs> library create new version because now we need to generate the, um, the placeholder for the 3D model so that we can replace the placeholder. Luckily this particular um, part doesn't take very long. Uh, doing that create new version is reasonably quick. So you don't have to uh, go away and make a cup of tea while that happens. So now if we have a look at the... Um, I know that's different. Now if we look at the uh, micro SD socket, it's on here. Micro SD socket EP. Which one is it? There are two in here. I'm going to have a look at um, which one is in the design. Because there are a couple of variants of it. Micro SD socket PP. So back to the library. Micro SD socket. PP, that one, and this is the model that we want to replace. So let's go back to RabCAD because that's the source for all cool 3D models and community library. Now I'm going to search for micro SD card holder. Let's see what we can find. No. Um, lots of models of micro SD cards. Oh, look, there's a model of a holder that looks pretty close to what I want. Looks very cool. Oh, there's a hinge type socket, which is interesting. Um, on some boards, I've got this hinge type uh, micro SD socket, and on some boards, I've got this pop in type socket. And this is the one that is in the uh, on the Ether 10. So uh, .stp, so it's got a step file. We'll select that and download. That's done. And what's it called? 473. You've got to take it. Take note of what it's actually been called on the thing. So now back to Eagle, and we'll edit uh, micro SD socket, and we'll upload the step file. So click upload step. We won't use the package generator this time because we can't make, there's no package generator for the micro SD thing. Um, there we go. That step file, we'll open that. Pushes the step file up to the AutoCAD cloud service, Autodesk cloud service rather. And let's see how closely it matches the footprint. I don't think there's a lot of variation in micro SD sockets, so it's probably going to be pretty close. Now you can see here that the origin is totally wrong. Um, and we can just grab the little axis slider. Oh, that's interesting. 
the uh, it is wrong in terms of the um, the connections. So we can see here on our footprint, we've got pads down towards the back, and on their model, they've got these um, these pads in the middle here. And it's offset a little bit to the side, so I'll slide it. So once again, I'm using this as a placeholder, and it's not going to be an accurate representation on the board, but it'll be close enough for our purposes, and we've gone on long enough today, so I've just positioned it within the... It's funny, I'm moving my head to try to look around the 3D model. It doesn't do anything on a 2D screen. So I've positioned it so that it's over the footprint of the, um, the part that we care about, and I'll click OK and acknowledge it and um, it's now going to port down to the local library so once again we have the situation we've got to save and library create new version push it synchronize blah 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 do the little library dance and then we end up with the local library again with the 3d model and the managed library stored on the cloud service with the 3d model so, uh, now I can go back into here, we'll do our little part placement process again, and if we look in our connectors library, there is now, there should be, a micro SD socket, and the one we want is that one, which is the one that I just added the model for, you can see the model has appeared in there, click that, we'll click that part to replace it, save back to the PCB uh, it's out of sync push to fusion push <clears throat> do a little dance oh interesting <laughs> I've just totally screwed up the footprint for um, for that part the orientation must have been out Something has gone badly wrong, so I'll need to fix that, but you don't need to worry about that. Um, what we'll do now is just look at how this has ended up, and then I'll wrap up this live stream, because I've been talking for nearly three hours, and I need a break. All right, so push has finished, and I keep going to that menu to switch to Fusion 360. It doesn't work. So we'll close that, refresh the project, open the refreshed project, and now we should have an SD socket on the board. And we do, and it's backwards, which is interesting. Oh, that's because of the rotation, yeah, the, um, the alignment on the, the board. So you can see that the SD socket now is facing in the wrong direction. Um, so there is definitely a problem there. The out the outset, like the the um the external part of it is just here, and the um, the internal part of it is here. So it needs to be rotated 180 degrees, and um, also needs to be moved up because it should be in this space up here. So obviously both the origin point and the rotation of that model were totally different to what was on the board previously. And um, so what I need to do now is go back in and fix that and um, then just push to fusion again and then it should look fine. But <clears throat> I think we've done enough now that I'm going to stop because at the start of this exercise, um, when I began this live stream, this board didn't exist in Fusion 360 at all. It was an old project in Eagle. It had unmanaged uh, library parts on it. We've now converted it over so that most of the parts on it are coming out of managed libraries. Only a few to go. It wouldn't take that much longer to finish it. And we've got 3D models associated. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, at least we'll stop someone stealing the SD card. Yeah. Um, so we've got a 3D model and that's enough barring fixing the SD card alignment um, that you could now use this as the basis for designing a case around it. 
And um, this is actually something that I've been wanting to do for a long time is, uh, is get a 3D model of the, uh, of the Ether 10 because I want to be able to do things like design cases around it and I haven't had that model. Previously, what I would have had to do <clears throat> is look at the physical geometry of the PCB and recreate it from scratch in a project like in a program like Fusion 360 or some other 3D program and sketch out the the shape of the connectors and everything else. And of course there's this disconnect. What you're doing is creating in parallel a representation of something that already exists in the electrical CAD world. Now what we've got is the 3D model and the electrical model are linked. They are loosely linked. It's not a live update. You still have to synchronize. You have to push the design from one direction to the other. But it means that we can make changes now on the board, like move connectors around, and within a minute or two, just press the sync button. Those changes can be reflected inside Fusion, and now you can adjust your 3D design around the changes that are made in the electrical design. So, yeah, that's um, a lot of what I've been doing over the last little while is uh, 3D models for things. <coughs> and uh, migrating a lot of my parts libraries over <coughs> to make them manage libraries so that I can do this sort of thing. And as you can imagine, a fair bit of the time that I've been going through this today has been talking about showing the process of how you add uh, models to your library parts. But if you already have libraries in place, once you've been doing this for a little while and you've got models associated with all of your parts, if you have a design like this that you want to convert, it's reasonably quick because all you need to do is say, um, do a part replacement on the resistors and go through the schematic and zap, 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 change all the resistors and change the headers and things like that. And in the space of maybe half an hour, you can go from a design that's using um, just traditional libraries to manage libraries with 3D models and then have it represented in Fusion 360. It's really quick. Um, a lot of what I've, the delay of what I've been showing you today has been uh, how to add the models in the library and messing around with those sorts of things. But if you have the parts in there, and particularly if you start the design from scratch, once you've got these managed libraries with 3D parts, and this is um, this is kind of what happened with this hand heater assembly. We um, well, we've been working on this design for a while, but now if I create a new design inside Eagle, and I'm putting down parts, I'm putting down parts from my managed libraries, which already have 3D models associated with them. So I can lay out a board basically one button click, well, a few clicks, and that is now inside Fusion, and you can do modeling around it. So um, I'm going to end it there, because it's, uh, it's kind of lunchtime, and I'm tired. But thank you very much for coming along. I, um, oh, where is this? Right. So yeah, thanks very much for coming along and checking out the live stream. I'm going to try to do a few more. Uh, what I might do is some live streams in the future, back to what I was doing previously with opening designs and explaining them why I did things in certain ways. And uh, I think that is kind of useful. It's useful for me anyway, even if nobody watches it. And um, I'll also be interested to know how well this worked because this is the first time I've live streamed since August last year, I think it is. And I stopped because um, my internet connection was rubbish and it was going out at like 320 by 240. So if this is working fairly well, my upstream is working okay and uh, it's coming through clearly, that's great. I'll do more of these. So thanks everyone. Have a great Saturday or Friday night if it still is Friday night for you in your part of the world. And um, go and make something cool. I'll see you soon. Bye.